April 14, 1865 is remembered as the night of Abraham Lincoln's assassination. But in Washington, it was an evening of general treachery. There were evil men about. Lincoln was shot. Secretary of State William Seward was stabbed. General Ulysses S. Grant was targeted, but was fortunately out of town. Vice President Andrew Johnson was on the hit list, too. Johnson was offered tickets to attend the play at Ford's Theater, but turned them down. Uh, probably a good thing. But Lincoln assassin John Wilkes Booth knew exactly where the vice president would be spending the night. He assigned a co-conspirator to go to Johnson's suite at the Kirkwood boarding house. Johnson retires to his quarters at the Kirkwood house. He's completely unaware of anything that's going on. Uh, in fact, uh, sits up part of the night reading, and then goes to bed. If all had gone according to plan, Johnson would have been awakened sometime later by a knock at the door, at which point a knife would have been plunged into his heart. But it never happened. The man assigned by Booth to assassinate Johnson lost his nerve, uh, started drinking, decided he wasn't going to go through with it. So the vice president was spared, and when Lincoln died of his wounds the following morning, Andrew Johnson became the first American president to gain the office because of an assassin's bullet. That's part of what will evolve into Johnson's difficulties. He assumes the presidency. He was not elected to it. And so Johnson is coming in as, a, as virtually a pretender to the throne. Number 17, Andrew Johnson. Democrat Union, 1865 to 1869, 56 years old, from Tennessee. Andrew Johnson was nothing like his martyred predecessor. Unlike Lincoln, he was a Southerner and a Democrat, and had at one point owned a small number of slaves. But during the Civil War, he was the only senator from a seceding state to remain with the Union, and he had been selected as Lincoln's running mate in 1864 to broaden the ticket's appeal. Nobody anticipated at all Johnson becoming president. If anyone had thought that might possibly happen, they certainly wouldn't have put him on the ticket. Johnson was regarded as stubborn or principled, depending on whether you agreed with him or not. Like Lincoln, he had risen from poverty to prominence through his own determination. This upward striving in Lincoln went along with the kind of wit and modesty and open-mindedness and ability to deal with all sorts of people. Somehow with Johnson, he has this closed-in personality. He's very self-oriented. He doesn't listen to other people. He doesn't care about other people. He doesn't have very many friends. Johnson's background and personality greatly influenced his management style. He had no formal education and had trained to be a tailor. He also had a righteous streak. Johnson was dogged and stubborn, inflexible. Once he took a position, uh, he was never willing to compromise it. He, he has a tendency to see conspiracies on all sides against him. He was thin-skinned about criticism. So in all of these respects, he differed sharply from Lincoln. For a model on how to run his new presidency, Johnson looked to a former president with whom he shared a home state and a very similar name, Andrew Jackson. One of Jackson's great quotations is, our federal union it must be preserved. And Johnson picked that up and used that throughout his career. And the argument can be made that he was the last Jacksonian. Like Jackson, Johnson believed he was the voice of the common man, or at least the common white man. He's probably the most racist president we've ever had, and uh, he thinks he talks about blacks as savages, barbarians, and he really thinks they should just go back to work on the plantation and leave the public sphere to whites. When Johnson took the oath of office, the Civil War was essentially over. Now it was up to the tailor from Tennessee to stitch the tattered union back together. His entire legacy would be staked on the question of Reconstruction. Well, I think the Reconstruction crisis was the greatest crisis in American history other than the crisis of the Civil War itself. Because what was at issue was not simply bringing the South back into the Union, but defining the essence of the American nation. Who is going to be a citizen of the United States? What are the rights that citizens are to enjoy? Who is an American, basically? Among the most eager to learn about Johnson's policies were the so-called radical Republicans. 
the vocal, reform-minded wing of the party. Men like Pennsylvania Representative Thaddeus Stevens and Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner, they believed the South should be punished and the freed slaves protected, made citizens, and given the right to vote. Johnson played the role very skillfully in those first few weeks. And the immediate reaction is, yes, we trust Johnson and we can deal with him. Then Congress leaves Washington not to come back again until December. So Johnson uh, has that wonderful window of opportunity there to take over as president. What Johnson did with his opportunity was to come up with his own presidential reconstruction plan. Many in the defeated South were prepared for the worst. In April 1865, the South was lay prostrate at the feet of the conquering North, and many Southerners then were so shell-shocked that they would have been willing to accept almost any terms of Reconstruction. Johnson came in thundering revenge, punishment to these same people, and in their despair, while, while they thought, oh my God, you know, this is what our fate is going to be. But Johnson had a pleasant surprise in store for the dispirited Southerners. They are a conquered region, but he doesn't want to treat them as a conquered region. These are his people, after all. Nobody knows for sure what Lincoln would have done, but Johnson's plan favored amnesty for most ex-Confederates and quick acceptance of the seceded states into the Union. The freed slaves got little protection. They weren't guaranteed citizenship or the right to vote. Johnson was on the wrong side of history, on the wrong side of morality, on the wrong side of politics. He just was unable to recognize that the Civil War had changed the nation, that the emancipation of the slaves carried with it some obligation to protect the basic rights of these emancipated slaves. When Congress comes back to town in December of 65, Johnson announces that the restoration of the South has been completed. And that is startling news to the members of Congress. Congress immediately started passing Reconstruction Acts of its own, beginning with an extension of the Freedmen's Bureau, a measure begun under Lincoln to aid the transition of blacks from slavery into freedom. Johnson vetoed it. And from that point on, that will be the story of the relationship between Congress and the president. Congress passes, Johnson vetoes. Congress passes, Johnson vetoes. Johnson's 29 presidential vetoes shattered the previous record of 12, which was set by his hero, Andrew Jackson. When you hitch your presidential leadership to the veto wagon, you're not going anywhere. And Johnson, stubborn and defiant that he was, refused to see that. Now it was Congress's turn to make history. Beginning with the Civil Rights Bill of 1866, they realized they had the votes to override Johnson's vetoes. Their record of overturning President Johnson 15 times still stands. Throughout 1866 and 1867, Congress hammered away at Johnson's authority. In March of 1867, they passed the Tenure of Office Act, limiting the president's ability to remove appointees without the Senate's consent. It was a trap, and Johnson couldn't resist the bait. He suspended and later dismissed his Secretary of War, a holdover from Lincoln's cabinet. Take no prisoners was his attitude. And of course, um, that inspired the other side to fight back in the same way, and that's why he was impeached. By violating the Tenure of Office Act, Johnson gave the radicals in Congress an excuse to get rid of him. Articles of impeachment were drafted. Opposition only made him more and more stubborn. He was unwilling to meet his critics halfway. He was unwilling to listen to criticism. So he just destroyed his own presidency. In February of 1868, the House of Representatives made an unprecedented move, voting to impeach the president. Their charges were flimsy at best and clearly politically motivated. Johnson's the target of a vast left-wing conspiracy. He thought the impeachment was an outrage. He said the people who are violating the Constitution, impeaching me for violating the Constitution, should be the other way around. A trial in the Senate would determine whether Johnson's misdeeds amounted to the high crimes and misdemeanors required by the Constitution to remove him from office. If two-thirds of the senators voted to convict him, the Johnson presidency would be over. 
tickets to this trial were like getting tickets to the Super Bowl. No, they were scalped outside the uh, Senate chambers. It was a matter of great entertainment. It was like a big athletic event. It was the social event in Washington. And uh, the women and all their finery and the diplomats, everybody came to the Senate to see what was going to go on. It was a circus, just as it was in 1999. In the end, Johnson avoided conviction and removal from office by a single vote. Chastened by his run-in with Congress, Johnson passed the rest of his term quietly. After returning home to Tennessee, he would later become the only former president to be elected to the Senate. At the end of the day, you have to admit that he was no Abraham Lincoln. But who was? And Johnson lived with that shadow over him his entire tenure as president. I think Johnson, in a way, discredited the presidency. His intransigence helped empower Congress to take a greater and greater role in formulating major national policy. The troublesome relationship between Andrew Johnson and the Congress had a lasting impact on the executive office. For the next 30 years, a series of relatively weak presidents would occupy the White House. Andrew Johnson did not attend a single day of school. He taught himself how to read. 